Hello, uh, my name is Hannes. Um, um, I wanted to start the presentation, but I failed. So I'm running here a <coughs> Xen, uh, Xen Dom Zero operating system. Xen is a virtualized operating system. And I actually managed to find here a binary. It's called Mir Seal. It's actually an ELF binary, 64 bits. Build linked. It's actually not dynamically linked, but it's wrong statically linked. So it's actually a, <clears throat> a virtual machine. And I do have a seal.xl, which is actually some Xen configuration YAML thingy, which I can use to say xl create seal.xl. Let's grab some console output. Oh, what did just now happen? I will start with the presentation in a moment. <laughs> we, we see at the, <laughs> at the very beginning that we have a Xen minimal OS, so it's a minimal operating system. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> then we, <clears throat> we, we did some mapping of a memory and I will skip over that. Then uh, we <clears throat> skipped something. <laughs> <laughs> We have a timer, we have a console, we can see the console, we have a console, cool. <laughs> um, we actually don't have, uh, well, the <clears throat> call to get and of o camel run param and camel run param and path or return null because <laughs> unfortunately we are here now in a system where we don't have POSIX, <laughs> we don't have get and we also don't have lseek or so and then another call. So that was here actually the <clears throat> the start off of the OCaml runtime, and OCaml is a programming language. I will come to back that in a moment. Then we have a network interface. We couldn't open that view random, which is good, because I actually wrote my own. Um, and then we have a <coughs> an, an interface uh, on an IP, and let's, let's go briefly to, to that website. And it's actually running HTTPS. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Let's go here. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Hannes. I'm uh, from the University of Cambridge, and, they <clears throat> and I'm a postdoc there somehow. And I will talk a bit about operating systems. <laughs> I can't really use such an operating system. <laughs> what you can see here now, it's uh, FreeBSD and Xen and so on. <clears throat> what is an operating system? Well, it first loads the operating system kernel. So some basic input-output system of a computer, which is hardwired on a, on, a, on a small chip, that is actually able to start up the loading of an operating system kernel. And the kernel then starts at some point in a process called init. And init is then responsible for starting up the user land processes and services and so on. But the kernel is actually more interesting. So the kernel runs in supervisor mode. It has access to all the different pieces of hardware, all the device, devices and the buses inside of your computer and is responsible to manage that actually some output is written to the graphics card and if there's some packets received on the network card or some bytes present that it actually delegates it into the right process which is able to handle it and so on. <sighs> so that is actually what is going on here? That is actually Unix. So we have an operating system. Um, let's assume that we have here the hardware, here the, <coughs> the kernel, including a network stack file system drive is uh, some kernel threads. Then we have some user processes on top of that. Um, some programming language runtime, like Python, Ruby, Node, whatever you like. Then on top of that, we actually have the application we are interested in running. <laughs> and that application then <coughs> goes around into the file system in order to read its configuration files and tries to find it and needs to find out file permissions and user rights and does cruel stuff. So I don't understand most of it. But wait, what other people must understand that? Who understands that? Who is actually, who actually understands all those core pieces and the interaction between them. I believe there's 
a small, <coughs> a small fraction of that. And which parts do we actually need? So let me remind you. So these operating systems were designed for those machines. I don't have such a machine. <laughs> I don't want to have such a machine. <laughs> huh? Well, go for it. <laughs> so what we are doing, what I'm doing, is getting rid of all that legacy layers, all that crap. <laughs> I, I just run a small language runtime and then directly my uh, application code. Because I have to ask you, say I run a web server. Why does a web server need to know about user management? So my presentation here is served on a web server. It doesn't need to know anything about users. It doesn't need to know anything about processes because I live in a virtualized environment anyways. I have booted the hypervisor in order to separate my virtual operating systems and I start up as you do in, in, in the cloud. <laughs> anyways, you, you start up five virtual machines anyways and they don't know what physical hardware is. They get virtualized interfaces, never flags. So we, we just base our stuff on some virtualized thing down under. But that virtualized thing might be a Xen hypervisor or JavaScript or a RUM kernel, or a Unix binary <coughs> for development and so So what is Mirage OS? Um, well, <coughs> we develop operating systems from scratch. There's no legacy behind it. <laughs> we have a radical approach. We don't believe in POSIX. <laughs> we think that instead of running a general purpose operating system which also runs on your washing machine and on your microwave oven, we decided let's rather focus that a single operating system is very specialized and does one thing and does it right. So it's each Mirage OS, each unikernel is a single purpose operating system, a single purpose machine which only does one thing. It's not general purpose. If it's a name server, it does only serve DNS. If it's a web server, it only serves web and so on. And by <coughs> doing this radical approach with no legacy and no abstraction, we actually have the freedom to choose a proper programming language and actually do some design uh, designed for <coughs> nowadays systems. So what is important for a programming language? Well, it should be modular, you should be able to write declarative codes, and you should be forced to avoid boilerplate. Or at least you shouldn't, you shouldn't uh, lose focus by writing too much boilerplate, like here I need to allocate three more bytes, and here if I don't have three more bytes, I need to maybe wiggle that pointer a bit here and there. So. <clears throat> that is not the, I mean, we are in 2015 now. Nobody should do that. So <clears throat> what is uh, crucial for handling complex systems? And I still think that operating systems are complex systems. It's that we have uh, abstraction in order to, to, to handle all that complexity. And abstraction comes to you at the very basics. So first of all, you have variables already in your programming language. And variables help you to abstract over concrete values. Then you have functions which help you to abstract over bodies and function blocks. Then you have higher order functions which, which help you to abstract over here yeah, functions. <laughs> then you actually have modules which help you to um, abstract over interfaces or over set of uh, functions. And well, it all boils down that you actually want to compose uh, small functional units. And that's where we are. We are into functional programming. So what are the main goals? We have uh, memory safety. So we have automatic memory management. That is nowadays not a rocket science anymore. <laughs> that is <clears throat> very well established. And actually, I don't believe anyone wants to manually manage their memory. But maybe the Rust people. Um, but <laughs> then <coughs> we, we, we do have type safety, so we have a strong static type system. We can actually use the types because we have, unlike legacy operating system which don't have a type, I mean they don't have types, we, we do have types and we can use the type system to express some properties, some lightweight invariants. And then we <coughs> want to be very explicit and explicit about 
data flow, which is very important to not have all over the place data flow between two functions by using shared mutable state, by using a heap, but <coughs> having arguments and values as a single uh, set of data flow. And then side effects, well, we avoid or we make them explicit. What is a state? Well, it works on several backends. It uh, boots actually fast. Uh, we need, we actually have some protocols. I implemented TLS, uh, transport layer security, over the last one and a half years. Uh, we need more of that, and we have some pointers. But I uh, nevertheless wanted, first of all, to go here <coughs> and show you a concrete application. So that is a very small, well, I can't make it bigger. Um, so <coughs> our unicornal consists of uh, two, two files. One is the configuration. It just says, oh, there's somewhere a unicornal.main module will, which takes a console and returns a job. And a job is just a task or whatever. And the unicornal.main module is down here. It has a single function called start. And start takes a console starts, takes a console, and then goes uh, from zero to four and locks hello, waits a second, and then world. And this thing here, I can run make, and make compiles it <coughs> magically into uh, some, some statically linked 64-bit um, executable, and that is actually, uh, and that is actually something I can start as a start as a virtual machine. So I give it some memory, and now it pauses. And now you can see the initialization of the minimal operating system, and then hello world all the time. It's a very minimal. It is a very minimal operating system, oh, but oh, yes. huh? <laughs> <laughs> but on, on top of that, we also have seen the so-called seal image here, uh, which currently takes 32 megabytes and actually ran the entire uh, presentation. So it is actually a, a full web server which serves websites using TLS and runs as a microcom. I think my time is over. We are.